Hello. Um, hello and welcome to today's webinar. This is the second uh, session in the 2023 Kenja Ishihara Colloquium, Advancing Earthquake Engineering in the Wake of the Turkey-Syria Earthquakes. Uh, this session will focus on functional recovery of buildings and lifelines, and it's hosted by the San Diego Regional Chapter of ERI. My name is Elizabeth Angel. I'm ERI's Communications and Program Manager. And before we get started, I just want to take a brief moment to talk about ERI. For those of you who aren't familiar with us as an organization, ERI is the leading nonprofit membership organization bringing together people from a wide range of disciplines and fields across the world who are working to re reduce earthquake risk uh, and improve earthquake resilience in our communities. Um, so you can find out more and join us at that link there. I'll share that in the chat later and learn about the benefits uh, of ERI membership. And I want to also remind everybody that our annual meeting is coming up next April in Seattle. Uh, it's going to be terrific. We're going to have like a two-day technical program with a lot of interesting panels, poster sessions. We'll also have workshops, a reconnaissance workshop, a full-day field exercise based on a Seattle fault scenario that's being organized in cooperation with the Washington Geological Survey, the Seismic Design Competition, and more good stuff. So check that out. And if you were planning to submit either a poster abstract or a special session proposal, the deadline is next Tuesday. And on that note, I will turn it over to today's moderators from the San Diego chapter. Alvaro, chapter president, do you wanna take it away? Yeah, thanks Elizabeth. Uh, and thanks everyone and welcome everyone to the fifth Ishihara Colloquium on Earthquake Engineering. Um, this is the fifth time we're doing this uh in san diego uh, typically in person before the pandemic and after the pandemic it's been a mix of hybrid and webinars uh this year is a full webinar uh but thanks again everyone for attending and also thank you to all the speakers um uh, that graciously uh time for your, your valuable time for the eri uh community in san diego um special thanks to the eri san diego board uh, that organizes these colloquiums every year. Um, and with that said, I'm going to introduce you to our two moderators of today, Hamid Sarmadi, Senior Earthquake Engineer with Bechtel and Secretary Treasurer of the ERI San Diego Chapter, and Gloria Faraone, Assistant Professor of the College of Engineering at the S San Diego State University, SDSU, and also a board member of ERI San Diego. And with that, Gloria, uh, if you wanna take it away. Yes, thank you so much. Thank you, Alvaro. Thank you, Elizabeth. So I think we could get we should we should get started with the uh, the agenda. So we will have uh, the very first speaker. Um, he's gonna talk about the 2023 Turkey earthquake uh, earthquake scenario performance of hospitals. We have uh, the pleasure of welcoming here today Ali Samir. Ali Samir is a licensed structural engineer with a PhD in structural engineering. He is the manager of the hospital seismic retrofit program at California Department of Healthcare Access and Information, where he is also the chief intelligence officer of the Emergency Operations Center. Ali has experience in seismic retrofit projects, performance-based design using nonlinear analysis techniques, building collapse risk analysis, and equipment shake table tests. So let's say. Uh, Welcome, Ali. Um, can you hear me and see the screen? Yes. All right. Uh, thanks, Gloria. Um, first, I'd like to uh, thank uh, ERI, uh, San Diego chapter, for organizing this event. Um, thanks, Elizabeth, uh, Alvaro, and Gloria. Um, there has been a lot of logistics behind this, so um, thank you. Um, the the performance of hospital um, observations wouldn't be possible with the ERIs ERI folks. Um, uh, every earthquake they they did a tremendous job. The logistics behind these uh, international travel is huge. So uh, there are many people who um, who made this uh, made this happen. Let me put my um, there we go. So uh, our team uh, focused on hospitals and hospitals only. Uh, the uh, 
these folks are very well known uh, engineers. Uh, probably um, everybody in in this um, webinar knows all uh, all these um, engineers. We were also uh, we also uh, had uh, Dr. Volkan Kara from Turkey. Uh, he's a, a surgeon. Um, so uh, it, it was great to have him on our team uh, so that we understand the um, the terminology, the the function of hospitals, how they operate, um, uh, the connections. So uh, Dr. Kara was uh, instrumental um, uh, during our visit. Also, Yuxal Tonguç, um, he owns a large structural engineering firm um, in in Turkey. Uh, besides uh, a lot of things that he did um, logistically, he also helped us understand the the local codes. The, the practice, the enforcement, etc. Uh, I'm not gonna go through the whole list, but again, these international travels take a lot of people's help to, to make this happen. Um, one very critical uh, uh, thank you, it goes to Afad. Um, so they're like a equivalent of FEMA here. So uh, they uh, allowed us to uh, get access to, to hospitals. Without their permission, we wouldn't be able to uh, really go to any hospital. So, and, and many thanks to uh, other people. Before I uh, start the, the conversations and go through the observations and, and the, um, the conclusions, it's really important to understand some, um, some differences, fundamentals about hospitals. So just take any, for example, campus in California, hospital facility campus. When you look at the Google Maps, you see a blob of uh, buildings in, uh, in a certain area. Um, and um, during an earthquake, this facility basically suffers from um, external cuts uh, from, the, from the lifeline, such as electric, gas, water, communication, sewer. So, Basically, the, the hospital uh, idea and design really um, circles around uh, this uh, expected fact of, of an earthquake. So uh, if you can imagine, it's really a, um, a building in an island, um, basically taking care, trying to take care of the, uh, the patients inside. So uh, the idea is uh, not getting external help uh, for a, a period of time till the, all the utilities uh, are are restored. So how in that scenario, how can the hospital function? What are the things that need to happen to give the service to, um, to the community? So there are three aspects. The first one is structural. We all are familiar with beams, columns, shear walls, slabs, foundations. The hospitals are designed uh, to a higher performance, uh, higher force levels, uh, stricter um, uh, enforcement. Now, uh, not only structural, but also non-structural is key to, um, to the performance of a hospital. When we mention non-structural, we really mean a lot of things such as cladding, partition ceiling, equipment, pipes, furnishing, contents, elevators, stairs, and uh, the in-house water tanks, fuel tanks, sewer tanks, uh, that an emergency generator that makes the uh, hospital function. Now, the most important uh, third um, entity is staff. So doctors and nurses, um, they are the key and the most important aspect of hospital functionality. Uh, structural engineers and all the designers, all we are trying to do is providing structural and non-structural so that doctors and nurses do what they do every day, they do their magic. So all we are trying to do is really help doctors and nurses uh, do their job much easier. So uh, I added the slide to really um, put a perspective of hospital evacuations. So uh, a lot of times people say, well, if that it doesn't work, then the hospital gets evacuated. Uh, now the problem is solved. Well, that, that's really not uh, the, the case. The hospitals are expected to remain operational after an earthquake or any disaster. So uh, if you think about hospitals, they have an existing 
patient load uh, currently, and they need to take on the additional surge coming from from an earthquake. So if you if you imagine today, if you try to get any um, I don't know appointment for your regular doctor, they give you a you know um, <laughs> appointment four months later. So there is no earthquake today, but even today, the hospitals are full. So and think about that now the additional surge coming to to that environment so in in a hospital world uh evacuation is not a conservative choice uh it's not being on the safe side there are a bunch of um patients that are um tied to uh life uh supporting equipment icu patients so evacuating those patients are um basically very um uh, very problematic. So evacuation of a hospital is truly the last resort. Um, and again, in a big earthquake scenario, nearby hospitals are also in the same boat so that they are most likely being overwhelmed just like the hospital right next door. So now going into uh, the, um, the earthquake in Turkey. So I'm going to skip um, the, the hazard side, because that was um, covered uh, quite detailed uh, in the past seminars. So what I want to point out again is the similarity of uh, what, what we see in Turkey versus California. Uh, I just tried to bring back the, the perspective here and compare to what's happening there so that um, we understand the situation um, much better. So th this figure is by uh, Sarkan Boskurt and Ross Stein. Uh, I, I like this figure because it truly shows what California has versus what Turkey has. So the, the North Anatolian fault, the shape, size, slip rate, age, length is super similar to, uh, to California. Uh, again, the idea here is what is happening in Turkey can really um, happen in, in California. The, um, the sequence uh, that happened back in February is really four events. Um, so uh, again, in big, big earthquakes, it's not just one event. There are a lot of aftershocks or triggered uh, sequential events. So again, to give a perspective, um, the aftershock of 7.8 was a 6.7 and Northridge earthquake was a 6.7 event. So that kind of gives you the scale of um, what happened in Turkey versus what we remember uh, in the past uh, in, in, in California. So um, again, to give the uh, additional perspective, since this is a, a webinar um, for the San Diego chapter, I basically took all the um, uh, acceleration control plots and uh, copied to, um, to Southern California. Again, this is uh, a rudimentary, just copy paste uh, to, to Southern California, again, to give you some uh, perspective on how uh, a scenario like this uh, would look like in, in Southern California. The, the green dots are the uh, healthcare facilities, uh, hospitals and skilled nursing facilities in HKI's uh, inventory. So uh, the red contour, that you see over here would be the most affected area in, and that's what we observed in, in Turkey. Um, if that scenario would be here, half of our inventory of general acute care facilities will be in the highly affected zone. Uh, about 600 skilled nursing facilities, about a thousand uh, would be again in highly affected zone. So what I'm trying to say is, when you think about evacuations, really the um, everybody's on the same boat. So um, evacuations would be not quite um, uh, practical. What are the chances of getting uh, such a big event? Uh, USGS already did study and published uh, fact sheets back in 2015. Uh, a 7.0 earthquake happening in the next 30 years was 75%. 7.5 magnitude is about 36%, and an eight event is about 7%. So this is the Southern California um, risks. 
Northern California plus minus few percentage point is about the same. So um, again, the, the hazard is very similar. Going back to what happened in Turkey, um, this photo is from Associated Press. This kind of gives you a, a, a general idea about the, the performance of um, typical building stock uh, in, in that region. So I wanna just point out a couple things and uh, Rupa and Reed will really go deep into uh, this, but uh, the, the stock differences between um, a almost no damage building right next to collapse damage uh, next to partial collapse. So the whole spectrum was there. This also represents the um, the material type, um, it's mostly concrete, um, unlike um, here in the United States that uh, we don't have um, this type of buildings. Um, but again, the uh, a lot of things that you're gonna see on my presentation and most likely the following presentations will more about the concrete structures. Um, the the aftermath is really uh, very um, very sad. Uh, more than fifty thousand people um, lost their lives, and um, uh, estimated about more than two million people uh, lost their homes, um, and they are uh, relocated to many other cities. Uh, there are many more million people who uh, relocated to other parts of the country, although. Um, their their home was not collapsed, but again, even like the damage, uh, a lot of people left their homes. So again, our our um, team focused on hospitals. Uh, the what we wanted to see is a, a variety of uh, hospitals, um, from big to small, um, and really look at not only. The, the structural side and non-structural side of things, but also uh, how did it function? Um, how how was the performance? What were the things that really um, uh, made the hospital function or not function? And hopefully um, do some uh, improvements in, in our practice uh, for future. So in order to draw some conclusions, we need to understand uh, the inventory in the hospital building inventory in Turkey. Um, the, in the last 20 years, there was a, 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 a bigger transformation in the healthcare system. The, uh, the, the big um, direction was um, replace uh, the older uh, and distributed hospitals into bigger, newer so hospitals. It's more like a consolidation in um, in in many cities, so um, the so it it basically the hospital the the, the building wise uh, obviously when you start consolidating the building gets bigger, uh, it's less number of hospitals but it's it's a new building stock. Um, to to look at the numbers, um, there were about eleven provinces. Um, in uh, in Turkey that got affected, uh, Hatay and Kahramanmaraş uh, did the most affected um, uh, towards the the, uh, the epicenters, and uh, Adıyaman, Osmaniye, Malatya, Gaziantep, um, uh, they are uh, still significantly affected, but um, compared to Hatay and Kahramanmaraş, less. Adana and the rest is um, again. Uh, less affected. We are talking about 14 million people. So it's an urban setting. Uh, so it's it's not a, a rural area um, uh, scenario. It's it's truly an urban setting. It's about 100 hospitals uh, in uh, in that scenario. Probably you 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 start seeing the difference. Like we would have about 200 uh, in in Tur uh, Turkey earthquake cases. About 100 because of a lot of consolidation. But the number of beds per patient is about the same with California, 17 versus 18. Uh, so it's pretty close. Again, in the last 20 years or so, the uh, the level of uh, seismic stations, the uh, the 
uh, instrumentation has been significant, uh, especially uh, a lot of um, instrumentation were done uh, along the, the fault line. Obviously, uh, this shows that this was kind of expected. Um, so there is a wealth of information uh, that was shared. Um, and I, I, I heard a lot of researchers are doing uh, a lot of good work to correlate these uh, ground motions to the um, uh, performance that, uh, that that's seen on the ground. So more to come on, on that. We collected information for about uh, 30 plus hospitals. Um, again, to give you a, a bit perspective, most of the hospitals are government owned. Like in California, it's more private uh, owned and um, not many government owned. Uh, Turkey is just the, uh, the other, other way, mostly government owned, uh, some private and university hospitals. Again, without AFAD's permission, uh, we wouldn't be able to visit these uh, hospitals. So with the, um, uh, with the paperwork and everything, we uh, had a chance to observe a lot of hospitals. Going to the structural system quickly, um, the, we observed about a third of the building stock there for the fixed base and less than half for seismically isolated hospitals. The lateral force resisting system is generally a reinforced concrete shear wall or a moment frame or a, or a combination. Gravity load carrying system, uh, no, uh, not, nothing special, flat plate, waffle, one way joist with hollow clay tile left and place form sometimes. Foundations, again, uh, what we see here, sometimes deep foundations, uh, mats, spread footings, and seismic joints are, again, very similar here. Um, the, the, the big, um, I guess, pattern uh, is the structure of the hospitals, the beams, columns, shear walls, uh, they uh, those elements performed very well. Um, the few hospitals collapsed. Uh, those were more on the older side. Uh, but the structurally, um, if if you are in the ASC forty one world, it was between IO and LS. Um, so we were very surprised to see uh, you know the the good performance of um, structural. Uh, in the newer hospitals. The non-structural was unfortunately um, uh, not, not good at all, and it resulted in, in closure in most of these hospitals. To give an example, um, this is uh, Iskenderun, a government hospital. Um, again, just like here or anywhere in the world, there are older uh, buildings. And then as the hospital grows, uh, the 2005 uh, newer concrete building and 2020 steel building. So what happened was the 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 old concrete building collapsed, um, killing 70 uh, patients and and doctors and nurses. Uh, 2005 concrete building was slight slight damaged, but got evacuated. And then 2020 steel building. Uh, this is one story, by the way, and this is five, five, six stories, five, six stories. So everybody um, tried to get into this steel building. What it served as was shelter and limited function. Obviously, when you lose most of your hospital, just one story building uh, really can't do much. So again, uh, to... Uh, to look at the time, the uh, the fixed base, uh, it's basically structural damage was minimal, but um, the older hospital collapsed, but the non-structural really uh, got, got it um, closed. The seismically isolated, which I will come to that one, generally performed well. Uh, we typically see on the shear walls, diagonal tension cracking. Um, and the horizontal cracks at the construction joint, very uh, expected. The infills were a big problem uh, because of the hollow clay tile or AAC. Um, it, 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 it generated a lot of issues with the uh, hospital equipment. 
columns beams, uh, very limited damage. The, um, the beams that we observed was generally flexural uh, hairline cracks, which was pretty minimal. Stairs, um, in general, they, they did okay, um, but we saw a lot of um, um, issues with the stair compatibility with the building drift that uh, basically got some stairs unusable. Foundations, um, it generally in pile supported buildings did very well. Uh, the shallow foundations, there are some settlement, um, uh, some settlement issues. Quickly going into base isolated hospitals. So there are about 11 uh, base isolated hospitals uh, in, in, the, in the affected region. So if you look at the distribution, some are uh, away, uh, some are uh, at the borderline of highly affected reason, uh, region and some right in the middle. So we, um, we observed um, the Adana one, Osmania, Dirtyol, and um, actually Rupa's team helped us uh, with one of the Malatya one. So, um, so I, I wanna talk about a couple of this. I would be very interested in this one. However, this base isolated hospital, uh, what we heard, we didn't visit, but what we heard and saw and uh, talked to the, our um, colleagues, the moat around the base isolated hospital were filled. And uh, unfortunately the base isolation because of that did not work as expected as you can imagine. If you constrict the, the movement of the uh, base isolation, then it becomes fixed base or something that you did not design. So, so unfortunately uh, the, uh, the, there's not much um, base isolated lessons learned from this particular hospital um but the rest did uh did, did okay um not gonna go in too much detail um about it but generally we saw good performance uh of the uh, base isolated hospitals that we visited and um uh, they they were pretty much um uh, immediately um, providing services to, to the public. Uh, one particular hospital that we I, I want to quickly touch on is the uh, Adana City Hospital that has triple pendulum. It's away from uh, the, uh, the epicenter, but that's this is the only hospital that, that was instrumented. So we have some data that show the, uh, the accelerations uh, at the at the bottom and at the top floors, so we did not see any surprises. Uh, the, um, the the base isolation did its job. One thing that I want to point out is um, this question comes: uh, Oh, you know, were, were there any dampers in these base isolated hospitals? Uh, we have not seen any. Uh, so typically, uh, when we say base isolated hospital, the ones that I know did not have any dampers. So. So there's no damper uh, data uh, in, in any of this um, presentation. So it's just the base isolation. So uh, we got a hold of the, um, uh, the, the hospital gave us the, um, the re recorded data. Again, um, no, no surprises, uh, the base isolation did its job. Um, this, this table is not our table. This is a uh, table from TIS uh, report that came out very recently. Um, I recommend you to take a look at it uh, for more information about the base isolated hospitals for a certain manufacturer. So there are good information. We, they, we had data from these three um, and the maximum displacement measured on the field uh, kind of matches what we uh, measured. So. Um, the one thing that I want to point out is, okay, after all this, what happened to, um, to the big picture? So I, I want to just first start with the Hatay province. Uh, so this is the most affected, um, province in, in the, in the region, about 1.7 million people, um, 12 government and few, uh, 
the um, private hospitals, about 17 hospitals. We went there at the sixth week mark. At that time, one fully functional uh, hospital was there and six partial um, functional. Pa partial meaning that mostly outpatient function. So no nothing, no big surgery or, or uh, inpatient uh, services and 10 closed. So uh, it, it's it, it it has been very difficult uh, for uh, for for the uh, people who try to get uh, healthcare. So in again um, looking at not only Hatay but uh, the surrounding uh, provinces, this is uh, what we gathered uh, on the operational status. So uh, this is the PGA. And this is the number of buildings. Uh, even on the low PGA, some hospitals got closed. Um, and as you go uh, towards the higher PGA, uh, it's, a, it's a mixed bag. The, the correlation got a little more clear when you plot the same thing uh, with the years of construction. Um, as you see, the, the older construction, the operational status was a whole lot worse uh, compared to the, the newer building stock. Um, I, this is a replot of that same plot that we observed. Uh, now, uh, after we came back, uh, we started getting more information from different groups. So uh, there's a the Turkish Medical Association reports about the functionality. So we, we keep uh, building our database and add um, what was functional. Um, and we th this is kind of an updated chart that, um, that shows the functionality. Uh, I'm gonna very quickly go through the non-structural performance. Um, and I'm gonna skip through uh, a bunch of pictures, um, but the, the big conclusion is the main reason of um, closures was more mostly non-structural. Um, a lot of things that were not anchored, not braced, uh, unfortunately, uh, as expected, did not perform well. We, did, we looked at many different um, categories of hospital uh, non-structural items. And um, like from cladding, the, the old um, hello clay tile to marble to a more um, new cladding system. The new cladding systems did very well but the older brittle ones did not. Um, and then the rest is really um, a, a byproduct of um, the, the brittle um, partition wall system and also lack of uh, anchorage that really end up with many, um, many failures. So uh, there were also some good anchorage examples that uh, gave uh, good performance. The distribution system uh, bracing was mostly lacking. Uh, we looked at a bunch of medical equipment, uh, some MRIs due to shaking needed to get recalibration. So there were a lot of specific uh, observations. And the content uh, was also part of the, uh, the issue that uh, impeded functional recovery. Um, the Lifelines group will talk about um, more um, the uh, the water and and and, um, and the emergency power uh, side of things. But again, for hospitals, the ones that had on-site wells did um, better than the ones that had. Um, uh, that that didn't have anything or some uh, tanks. Uh, if you have a tank, but if you don't have a good distribution system that is working, then again, um, that's that that's an issue. Uh, Want to point out a couple other things. The post earthquake safety assessment. Um, there was a centralized system in Turkey uh, that really. Uh, went through the tagging of buildings very efficiently. In the first few, uh, in the first seven days, I was looking at um, maybe more than 100,000 uh, buildings that were being tagged. So 
uh, if you um, if you reside outside of the country, you wouldn't have an access to the public website because they the government blocks outside access to the IP address. But if you had a VPN, you can uh, actually start looking at the performance or, or the tagging status with the photo of each building. So I was able to uh, put an address and look at um, the, the tagging information, which actually was very nice. Unfortunately, uh, the hospital tagging or the performance was not included on the public facing uh, website. Uh, I will take two more minutes and I want to emphasize uh, one important aspect. Um, for building evaluations and tagging, um, you know, that's generally done by um, a, a knowledgeable and qualified uh, engineer. However, for hospital cases, typically the, um, the evacuation decisions are made by the staff. So, and that evacuation decision is generally made in the first 15 minutes. So I wanna to emphasize to, to everybody that we, we need to do everything we can um, to make sure that you know, things are not falling apart. It's uh, anchored properly so that the staff feels safe enough to continue uh, the operations, but also um, need to do a lot of um, outreach education uh, to the hospital staff to really um, give some uh, training expectations um, what happens after an earthquake. So I put some um, observations um, that kind of summarizes uh, what I uh, went through over the uh, past slides. Um, and I, I wanna really go into the, um, the aspect of functional recovery and the fear of staff. Cracks in partitions, um, it's, it's a big deal. Uh, you may say to, to us, to structural engineers, it, it, it's, it's, it's superficial, like, you know, what's the big deal uh, if a partition cracks, you know, everything else is good. Well, public staff patients, they don't know that. So um, if, if the staff is afraid, if the public is afraid to go into a building, then there's no healthcare. So we wanna make sure that um, the, the, the fear aspect is real. Uh, we, we should um, therefore educate the, the public, get a bit more um, um, coordinated system to make sure that there's no unnecessary evacuations. In California, our department actually contacts with uh, the the facilities on minute number one, we try to be with them all the time. But again, fear is human. Um, so um, that, that's something that I cannot uh, you know, um, emphasize enough. With that, uh, I'm gonna just go to the, the last takeaways. Um, we will hopefully uh, put some more um, uh, data-driven information to, to some upcoming um, publications. And um, after this, I'll be uh, the questions. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ali. This was very interesting. Um, let's hold on with the questions. Uh, let's uh, first uh, uh, hear what Reed has to present us today, and then we will uh, take care of the question and answers. So uh, next speaker is Reed Dimmerman. He is the technical director of the Parkland Oregon office of KPFF, and has focused his career on advanced structural systems and complex analytical techniques for assessing the effect of extreme hazards on structures. He's active in the, in the US code development through ASC 31, ASC 7, and the Building Seismic Safety Council, including chairing subcommittees on functional recovery and seismic isolation and energy dissipation. So uh, let's welcome Reed, and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Gloria. So I'm going to try, I'm going to speak to you all today about 
recovery observations and lessons, uh, hopefully specifically applicable to the US um, as a result of the Karaman Rush earthquake sequence. So a bit a little outline of what I'll talk about today. I'm going to try and get a, give a little bit of context for the recovery observations and just note sort of why, even though the focus of the presentation I'm going to be giving today is about recovery, I uh, want to keep that in context with the extreme life safety uh, aspects of the earthquake. I'll also talk a little bit about the team and mission uh, that I participated in, uh, get into the actual recovery observations themselves. I'll have uh, like a, a little story about one of the buildings we looked at in Antakya, and then bring it back with uh, sort of a list of what I see as recovery lessons uh, for us here in the United States. So to set context for what I'm going to be talking about today, I'm going to show you two videos. One's walking uh, down a street in Karaman Rash, uh, outside of a collapsed building, and then we'll go inside um, what was tip a typical building uh, that I well, a typical building in which that I surveyed uh, while I was there. So with that, I hope you get a sense for uh, if you hadn't already the scale of sort of destruction. And Ali alluded to this uh, a bit in um, his presentation as well. But with respect to typical buildings, uh, this is showing a map. This is not this is not the data directly from uh, the the government website, but it's collected in a similar manner, uh, showing everything sort of in red there being collapsed orange being needing demolished, uh, purple being heavily damaged, and blue being slightly damaged. And if you're seeing here, this is from spanning from Santakia, Kazintep, Karaman Marash areas. Um, if you look on the right here, you can get a sense for just the scale of the tens of thousands of buildings that are in these collapsed, needs to be demolished or heavily damaged. And so hopefully you can you can appreciate here that even though most of my presentation, I'm going to be talking about sort of recovery lessons that aren't directly about, say, structural damage and collapse, uh, that we want to keep that keep in context uh, the level uh, of the level of significant structural damage and collapse that occurred. I think also to help keep in context and bring a lot of this back to uh, what we see uh, or how it can be relevant to, to what we see or could expect to see in the U.S. is just understanding the similarity of the Turkish building codes with what, how we design in the U.S. So uh, there, they had three different uh, codes, earthquake codes, um, 98, 2007, and 2018, the most recent three. Uh, most of the buildings that I observed were designed to the 98 or 2007 earthquake code. And for those, uh, they're designed to a 500 year return period event, not so different, I guess, than our design basis earthquake in the US. And in 2018, most buildings were still anchored to the 20, to the 500 year event or the 475 year event. 
with some critical facilities also designed uh, for the 2475 and either 43 or 72 year. Additionally, in the 98 and 2007 earthquake codes, uh, they're very similar to uh, how we designed uh, following, say, the 90, 1997 Uniform Building Code, in the sense that the size there was a seismic zonation uh, between one and four. Uh, it happened to be in reverse order to our, our 97 UBC, where in the 97 UBZ zone four was the highest and zone one was the least in Turkey. Uh, their zone one was the highest and zone four was the least. But I think you can appreciate in looking at those numbers, they're very similar, uh, uh, albeit in reverse order to how we designed uh, in the 97 UBC. Additionally, if you're looking at the spectra down in there at the bottom, you can see that they have sort of a two-point spectrum, very similar to how, again, we designed uh, and, and still many, many, many of us still design using the two-point spectrum today. In the 2018 earthquake code, uh, they there they converted to something quite similar, if not nominally identical, to how we design an ASC seven with the use of say SDS and an SD one. Another important distinction for observations about typical buildings in Turkey is around the year two thousand, and not only was there the change, so the ninety eight earthquake code. Um, uh, but also in the year 2000, there was a, the introduction of a building inspection law, uh, a change in the reinforced concrete design standard, which led to vast improvements in the quality and strength of concrete, as well as the elimination or disallowing uh, the use of smooth bars. So post 2000, uh, deformed bars were required. And then also a seismic safety tax with tax was implemented. Um, with the intention of funding seismic retrofit. Furthermore, uh, in, a, in, in addition to how the forces were determined for design, uh, they also used uh, a, a very similar process of a response modification factor like we do in the US. And even say, if we look at uh, what I've highlighted here for uh, reinforced concrete moment frames, which was by far the largest uh, structure type that I observed, uh, they have an R of eight, uh, which would be identical to how we would design a special reinforced concrete mode frame uh, in the US to AC7. And then of course, uh, uh, as you mentioned, uh, the North, North and East Anatolian fault system. And uh, if overlaying on that, this zonation map, uh, from the 98 and 2007 earthquake codes, you're seeing again, a reminder there. Zone one is, is think of that as UBC zone four. Uh, it falls right along the East and the North Anatolian faults. Um, in the, in 2018, uh, it went, they went to a sort of a point by point, uh, probabilistic calculated basis, uh, with a lookup tool, very similar to how we do for say AC7 design. Yeah, and, and it doesn't need to be said, but I will say it anyway, is Turkey is, is sort of no stranger to seismicity uh, and going all the way back to 1945 uh, have considered seismic hazard uh, in some way. I know there was a, a good presentation, was it last week or so, on some of the, the hazard aspects but just to, again, provide a little bit more context to what I, what the observations I'm going to be making, uh, this shows uh, from the AFAD stations, which Ali also spoke about, uh, a couple different spectra. I'm going to pull out a few. These are all from the, uh, the second event, the magnitude 7.8 event. So I'm just going to pull out a few, one from Qatar Manrush, uh, one from Takia, I think one from Turkoglu also. And just putting them up here. So again, we're looking at response spectra. Uh, so spectral acceleration on the vertical axis versus period. Uh, on here are plotted in dark black, the design basis earthquake. So that's the 475 year event. And then dashed gray is the maximum considered earthquake or the 2475 year event. And then uh, on in blue and red are the two components from these recording stations. I think what I want to impress upon here is for context of what we're going to be describing 
what I'm describing later in my presentation, that we're talking about between design basis and maximum considered earthquake shaking for a lot of the observations that we're making. And, and I'll show you uh, the places that I visited as part of the team I was on. Uh, we focused on the, the high the high intensity locations. And so these are observations that are relevant, very relevant to high intensity shaking and keeping in context uh, the fact that this is extreme ground shaking uh, that we're talking about. Okay, so the, the team and the mission that I participated on. I was with, uh, I was one of two members uh, going with the American Society of Civil Engineers, Structural Engineering Institute. My colleague, Rebecca Hicks Collins joined me. We actually embedded within a, a larger reconnaissance team led by the American Concrete Institute. Uh, they have a disaster reconnaissance committee. Um, in addition, we had two members from the National Institute of Standards Technology that joined us. A very, quite a large team. Uh, we surveyed hundreds of buildings uh, while we were present there. Uh, but I want to note that while we had a, we had sort of great a, number, a lot of great people coming in to Turkey, none of this would have been possible without the extreme support from the Insmir, Insmir Institute of Technology. We probably had one to one. Uh, out of country uh, to local presence uh, on our reconnaissance team. And that has, it was invaluable to our observations and work. So just going back here and looking, zooming in on, on where uh, we visited on the right there shows a graph of the, the 10 cities that we visited. We were actually anchored or based in Gaziantep so we'd come back there every night and then we would drive out uh, other than one day staying in Antakya, we would drive out uh, early in the morning and come back late at night. Uh, I was present there 10 days between March 26th and April 4th. So for context, that's about seven weeks after the earthquake. So what I'm going to be talking to you today about and have been talking to you about is observations seven weeks after the earthquake. I think that's really important because as we know, the recovery trajectory changes after the event. The prioritization of what happens immediately after the event changes dramatically between, say, as Ali mentioned, 15 minutes, 30 minutes, an hour, 24 hours versus seven weeks. And so what I'm going to be sharing is only my observations from seven weeks after the event. But from a, a quite a large uh, range of cities, as far to the southwest as Antakya and as far to the northeast as Adiyaman and Malatya. And our, our, our goal here was to bring back lessons for the U.S. and record some of the perishable observations. So some of those observations. Uh, I'll, I'll start again. I'm not going to focus on the structural damage, which was pervasive. Uh, and we could have uh, more than a 25 minute presentation just talking about that. What I don't want to talk about is some of the things that more affected recovery. Um, one of the things we always think about are stairs and stairs uh, uniformly there had no slip joints were cast in place concrete from floor to floor. And we saw this significant level of damage and I'll just jump here. I wanna show, I took a 3D scan of one of these um, to get give you a sense for, it's not just that the building drift imposes large demands at these, what they turn into essential braces, but there's also really poor consolidation and a lot of construction debris that happens right at these joints um, that we saw uh, after the event. Furthermore, I'll mentioned this, but uh, damage to non-structural partitions was uh, just everywhere uh, from varying from what we saw here, hairline cracking, Spider crack, spider web cracking in the plaster, just in the face shell of the plaster of say CMU blocks or AAC concrete or um, holoclay tile to sort of more, you see a little maybe a bed joint sliding and starting opening up of individual blocks opening up to here shows on the ground floor of this building, it's completely fallen out. Uh, and as you move up, you can see the varying level of damage to almost nothing or just separation right around the frame to about to fall out, crushed at the corners to completely gone. 
that was pervasive everywhere and had a big effect, as you saw in that video, walking around inside of just the general level of, of um, uh, disaster. But in terms of recovery, sort of our kind of recovery aspects or observations, uh, we tried to, to organize them into sort of three bins. Uh, and again, observations, this is at seven weeks after the event uh, or after the events, is what was a prior, what we saw as being prioritized in terms of services, what we saw as being inadequately provided and something, just maybe one thing about schools that we normally think of as schools as being critical, like we design them as risk category three here in the US. What we actually saw was a, the, even though generally we think them as them as critical services, they're uh, the, basically every all of those have been switched to remote learning. Uh, and so there was sort of alternative solutions being uh, proposed or implemented for for that specifically for schools specifically. In terms of maybe I'll work up uh, bottom up in in this table, inadequately provided services. Uh, far and above was that even though at least not spoke about there were very quickly after the event uh, evaluators out performing sidewalk sort of a sidewalk survey survey esque uh, evaluations of the buildings and entering that into the government database which we understood could be accessed uh, you could eventually access the public could eventually access it nothing was being placard in the way that we might see or expect to see in the U.S. following ATC 20 of sort of yet red, yellow, green. And so everyone, we almost everyone we spoke with there thought we were there to tell them how what, to evaluate their buildings and to tell them how it was doing. Um, and we constantly had to sort of say, no, we're not here for that purpose. Uh, like apparently there's this government website you can go to and look it up. Um, and that was really hard. Uh, the fact that that wasn't communicated in a way that the tenants uh, could really access uh, or understand. But then in terms of prioritized services, there's some of the typical ones that we expect to see. So definitely hospital emergency care. I spoke about that a lot. Uh, many Areas we saw were still operating kind of out of, uh, not fully out of buildings. Um, temporary housing and sanitation stations. I'll, I'll show you a few photos of those, including lots and lots of tents, off out and otherwise. Pharmacies, food banks, soup kitchens, mobile banks and ATMs. Uh, and then other things that we don't, I didn't necessarily always think would be a prioritized services. So cell phone towers, marketplaces, demolition. So here's uh, some modular homes that were being uh, placed and either dropped off on truck. Pharmacies on the left is of what used to be a pharmacy. You can see the pills strewn all about the ground. And on the right, you can see where there was an existing pharmacy and just next to it, a, a, modular, uh, a modular structure turned into an additional pharmacy. Here's a food bank. Uh, this is again on the left showing a uh, bank uh, with out of a modular building, and on the right actually an ATM in a out of a van, which I thought was quite clever. Uh, cell phone towers, as we maybe should know, is that most of the cell phone most of the cell phone towers or a lot of them are on roofs of buildings. And so when those buildings either collapse or are so heavily damaged or, or don't have electricity, uh, you can't have cell phone service and cell phones are essential for communications there. Everyone has a cell phone now. And so on the left is actually from Antakya, a uh, temporary cell phone tower. And in the center of the screen there, this is a, a small mobile generator like you might have at home uh, running continuously. Uh, presumably someone was coming to, to um, refuel it. Uh, periodically. Also, uh, like marketplaces. So on the right here, uh, modular modular buildings, Jasha, which is I think translates to bazaar. Um, and then on the left, this was actually in at the Amman, 
this was uh, the location of previously location of a school that had collapsed and they were pouring concrete slabs and building these light steel structures to again turn it back into a marketplace and uh, as a way to re reinvigorate the community and then demolition uh pervasive uh, everywhere we went, there were excavators uh, digging through on the video on the left. Uh, this excavator was digging through um, the building. It would then let the tenants come and sort of look through things, uh, look for personal items. It would start digging on this next one and then would alternate back and forth uh, was um, while we were there. And then, yeah. Uh, where does all that debris go? Generally, out you as we were running on the highway, there would be just anywhere there was a place in the land with a depression was being slowly filled in with all of this all of this um, collapsed debris. We also saw a few indications of people trying to do something themselves. Right, so on the left, you're seeing a very very damaged column that someone's put in some posts. On the right, a damaged beam. Again, someone's put in some like some steel uh, at, with an attempt to to support it. And on the right, there's some sort of plaster cracking that's uh, that's already been patched up, actually, and, and repainted. Also, evidence of uh, people coming in either uh, as part of litigation or otherwise and taking core samples. This is in Antaki, I believe, uh, of. Um, of buildings that are collapsed or are super heavily damaged. So I just want to finish off with uh, just a story of this Toki building in Takia that we visited. So Toki is, um, uh, they build mostly uh, social housing uh, and a lot built using tunnel for construction, which I'll explain. We don't have that really in the US, uh, but I'll explain what that is in a minute. So this is a, one of the, this is the building, a building we visited in Takia. And on the right there, this was the only time we saw something kind of posted. And if you translate what it said was in earthquakes that occurred on uh, February 6, 2023 in Karamanrash, Pazarjik and Elbushtan, there is no structural damage that, damage that prevents use. So basically saying um, it's not structurally damaged. The building occupants weren't within the building. I'll talk about what that meant in a minute. Uh, if you look at sort of a plan of this building uh, in blue there on the right are all the concrete walls. So a huge, high, super high density of concrete walls, especially in, in the up down direction on the page. And that's because this is, a, this is a tunnel form construction building. And so what tunnel form construction is, they use sort of a U-shaped form, they stick it in, they cast the walls and the floor slabs at the same time. And you get this sort of like cellular type structure building with a high wall density. We found that many of them performed quite well, especially in these shorter stories like this. I think this is six or seven. We had a chance to go inside and we actually walked with sort of the building administrator for uh, quite a while, uh, several, at least an hour and a half or two hours uh, with him, looking at the things that were damaged. Obviously, elevators weren't working. There was some, some of the like precast uh, that was at the roof had fallen off. Actually, the reason that the building wasn't occupied was there's a leak in the water tank, but that was actually being repaired while we were there. And the expectation was within a week or two that residents would be able to move in. So really, in compared to the everything around it, um, very much a success story. Um, that's not to say there wasn't any damage at the roof, uh, lots of tanks and other appendages, a lot of things maybe that probably had been abandoned had, and were unanchored had fallen off through the roof, through the wood roof, or fallen off onto the ground. Um, and this is actually the administrative event that we spoke with. And I think one of the things that stuck with me was, you know, we were there thinking about, you know, what's the functional recovery aspects of this this building and what lessons can we bring back to the US? And we asked him about, you know, these non-structural systems not functioning, the water tank being broken. His answer was, I'm okay with the elevator not working because I got my family out safely. And he has a wife and, and three girls, uh, but he got all safely out of the building. He actually has an apartment on the root, on the top story. Um, so the, just the fact, I think we need to keep in, into context when we're thinking about what recovery observations can we make also keeping not forgetting the importance of life safety. So just to summarize, 
the recovery observations that I see or the recovery lessons I see for the U.S. Um, structural observation and special inspection by the engineer of record are extremely valuable. Uh, we have that opportunity in the U.S. by code mandate. Uh, it doesn't exist in Turkey to the same degree. Often there'll be a field engineer who didn't have any part in the design who's looking at things. Um, it's very clear that some of the things get missed uh, when the engineer of record doesn't get out to site. Um, my observation, I, I, we, we looked at a lot of fixed base buildings, only one isolated building, but in reading all of the reconnaissance reports, I think something that needs to be stated is that seismic base isolation for the U.S. is the most, if not only appropriate solution for certain occupancies, maybe acute care hospitals in high seismic regions. Um, I think we need to continue to drive that point home uh, in Turkey, right? Any any hospital over 100 beds has to be seismic isolated today. We don't have similar rules like that uh, in the high seismic regions uh, here. Seismic retrofitting occurs slowly and has to compete with other societal needs. Uh, we didn't. We looked at hundreds of buildings. We didn't see one that was seismically retrofitted. Uh, I believe there's maybe the, another ER team observed one or two, uh, but the fact that there's uh, of of the number of buildings that have been observed, very few, if any, had been seismically retrofitted, speaks, uh, I think, a lot to the the conditions of seismic retrofit being quite hard to do. And maybe it's uh, we should focus on building new better uh, rather than trying to fix our problems later. Uh, Post-earthquake inspection and tagging requires communication and it often gets lost in a post-earthquake environment. Like I said, almost everyone we met thought we were there to evaluate the building, even though it's we believe that their building probably already had been evaluated, but just hadn't ever been communicated to them. And then I didn't talk about this a lot, but uh, I think you understood if you attended the previous event, uh, the previous uh, presentations is that this earthquake highlighted, like the Christchurch earthquakes highlighted, is that earthquakes are, aren't just one event, right? And when we're designing, should we be designing for only a single event or if there's a significant aftershock or another shock on a, a rate on a adjacent fault like here? Uh, that produced an even larger, uh, that where we have even large earthquakes. Um, what does that mean for our life safety and collapse prevention definitions? Uh, if it's we have a uh, building that doesn't collapse under one event and collapses under the second, uh, is that acceptable? And then finally, adaptation is inevitable uh, and it's going to be a necessary component of post-earthquake response uh, in the U.S. Um, and uh, we probably need to to recognize that. With that, I'll say thank you, and I'll pass it back to the ERI moderators. Thank you so much, Reid. Very, very interesting. So we have some time now for questions and answers. If we have um, any questions from the public, very uh, quickly, or we can uh, you... let me see. Let me check if there is any any questions. Alvaro, go ahead. We have a question from Alvaro. Yeah, we do. <laughs> <laughs> um, I had a question for Ali, maybe now, well, for Ali, it's, um, for Turk, um, for the country of Turkey, um, uh, is there, do you know if there's any similar program to the one in California, like SB 1953 that now will be implemented in Turkey, and also conversely, are you guys looking at any of the lessons learned from Turkey to refine the requirements for hospitals. And coincidentally, Reed mentioned that the base isolation systems, there's no requirement, but there's requirements in other countries like Turkey or Chile. Uh, Anything to say about that? Like yeah. both ways in Turkey and in the US? So being on the government side of things, um, I know that every country is different. 
uh, every country's um, the uh, healthcare system is different. Um, you know, it, it's based on um, you know many different realities. So um, it wouldn't be fair to say you know, you know California model is in I don't know in Turkey or New Zealand or so uh, the the models won't fit well now. Is there a is there a, a, a separate program? Uh, I'm not aware of it. Um, but again, uh, the the enforcement, the uh, like, for example, he, here we we don't like HCAR doesn't have a hospital, right? We we enforce the rules, but we don't have a hospital. But the, the Turkish government has a lot of hospitals, so it's a, it's a very different setup um versus what we have here so it wouldn't like just fit now the codes are very similar so it's um as reed uh started pointing out you know the the force levels and so um you know can something be implemented yes it, it can um but th there's no one-to-one -one ratio Thanks. Thank you. And we have another question in the chat. Uh, still for you, Ali, what caused base isolation constricted in some hospitals? Yeah, so again, uh, that constriction happened in one uh, hospital. Um, and I think there's another report about another uh, base isolated hospital. But basically, a, a base isolated hospital uh, typically has a, a space around the uh, the building footprint. So the base size of the hostel that needs to move in order for the um, these pendulums, circle pendulums, double pendulums to work. So uh, apparently uh, that space filled with dirt or concrete at, at some point. Um, so again, that also um, is it. It's important to point out that the, the continuous monitoring and inspection is important after building um, a good building. So uh, there are photos and, and reports um, basically showing the, since the space was filled, the, the, um, the building could not move and there were um, reported a bunch of um, damage to, um, to the infrastructure. So, that's what was reported. Perfect, thank you so much. And uh, we have a comment from Reed in the chat. Uh, if you're interested in uh, reading more about the uh, Reed uh, team uh, um, follow up after this uh, uh, earthquake uh, mission, you can find more information in the Structure Magazine articles. Uh, and there is the link here in the chat if you want to know more. Um, thank you, everyone, for coming back again. And you are with us on the second day of the fifth Ishiara Colloquium. Um, we're going to go with two more uh, speakers. Um, the third one of the, this day is one of my good friends, Ricardo Capa. Ricardo has a PhD from ge uh, in geotechnical engineering from UC Irvine. He's a professional engineer. He has more than 10 years of professional experience in performance evaluation of power and water infrastructures. Um, he's currently a senior consulting engineer at SGH uh, in Newport Beach uh, office in California. And he specializes in seismic probabilistic risk assessment methods for industrial and power uh, generating plant uh, with a focus on nuclear power plants. Um, so we, Ricardo, please go ahead and you. Can you hear me and see my desktop? Yes. All right. So thank you for tuning in. And it's a pleasure for me to share some of the lessons I learned from my trip 
in Turkey, where we reviewed the performance of lifeline systems. And uh, the focus of my presentation will be on uh, sharing with you one way that I use this field observation in my practice. So for those that don't know, uh, I had the pleasure to lead the ERI uh, Lifeline team planning and execution activities. My trip was co-sponsored by the Electric Power Research Institute, EPRI, with which I have um, collaborated on a number of these first circuit investigation and my company, SGH. My team included 16 engineers and combined with drove more than 3,000 miles in the epicenter region, which is roughly the distance between San Francisco and Boston, to give you an idea of the extent of the area we covered. We visited more than 160 sites, including dams, school plants, substations, tunnel bridges, treatment plants, airports, universities. So it's very diversified portfolio, a lot of data to digest. And so far, we have contributed chapter seven of the joint ERID report, which is available online and includes some of our preliminary observation and conclusion. We also prepare a dedicated webinar in mid-May, which is also available online. So I, I point you to that if you want to see the details of our preliminary observation and conclusion. We're planning to uh, publish a dedicated report specifically for lifelines later in the year. And a bunch of us in our team are working on conference and journal papers. So stay tuned for that. They asked me to present something new today, so I, I didn't want to repeat myself of what's included in those references. So I decided to summarize my takeaways from my trip in this single slide. So on the left side, I'm listing a bunch of selected lifeline systems, and I'm color coding what I think from a high level perspective is, or was the performance of these lifelines in different earthquakes that I personally review. So starting with the power grid, I think overall, we could say that the performance of the electric power grid in Turkey was very positive if you consider the unique, large, you know, significant earthquake sequence. And part of the reason for that was that the uh, um, power grid in the region is very dense. And there are many sources of uh, independent power generation. But I also wanted to give some kudos to the local operators, which had very good recovery plans in place. And right after the earthquake, they were able to dispatch, you know, deploy a large number, you know, uh, uh, significant um, uh, resources and manpower to fix functional failures. So they were able to recover power very quickly. Compare that to what happened in Puerto Rico, for example, where the 6.4 earthquake was offshore, but knocked down two large plants in the southwest portion of the island. And they produced about 20% of the power in the, on the island. The entire grid went off and it took them a while to come back. In terms of water and wastewater distribution system, I would say that would, that is probably the most heavily affected system um, in uh, during the this Turkish event, when we visited the region in mid March, six weeks after the earthquake, there were many areas that were still without water and uh, um, wastewater um, services, and I have a feeling that it's going to take them quite some time to to get back to full track. Compare that, for example, with Anchorage, where there was virtually no damage from a seven point one earthquake. And part of the reason for that was that Anchorage is relatively remote. So they understand that getting replacement equipment is difficult. And so they included an additional design margin to account for that in their system and equipment. And they also included some resilience strategies. So for example, one of the main reasons they performed very well is that uh, water and wastewater distribution system relied on gravity to operate, so they didn't rely on power. Transportation and hospital, I would say they were also significantly affected in Turkey. Uh, think about the rubbles in Antakya, impeding recovery operations, or Ali talked about the, uh, the hospital that were affected. <clears throat> we can talk about hours this core coding in this step in this slide, but the point I wanted to make from a high level perspective is 
different lifelines get affected differently in different earthquakes worldwide. So there is always something to learn. And definitely these Turkish experience taught us something. For the sake of today's presentation, I decided to focus on uh, one topic, um, which is how we turn this field observation in something useful in our practice. And I'm gonna focus on how we develop equipment capacities based on experience data for use in seismic probabilistic risk assessment, which is one of my area of uh, expertise. In other words, say you visit a pumping station following the earthquake, the building has collapsed, your pump has survived, you have a ground motion on your side. How do you translate that into numbers and how do you use that into the, your practice? So before I start diving into the equation, let me give you a little bit of background of why this is useful and why this is important. So you may know that there are three typical methods to establish equipment capacities in practice. You can either use numerical simulations, so you build your finite element model, which is very detailed, tends to be equipment specific and expensive, but the advantage is that you can test your model under different loading condition. Shape table tests provide a different sets of uh, information in the sense that you can get uh, a much better representation of what would be the true behavior of your, your equipment in um, under vibration. But shape table tests tends to be expensive, and especially if you want to test large components like transmission transformers or engine generators, that becomes very prohibitive. So there are some limitations and some advantages to that. Earthquake experience data on the other side provide two main benefits. One, they provide a testimony of the true performance of equipment in real life earthquakes. So they inherently incorporate non-linearity that are difficult to model in shake table test and analysis. And, um, most importantly, they provide an opportunity for significant cost savings in the sense that once you have developed a sufficient uh, level of understanding of what's the performance of a class of components, then you can then apply the same knowledge to many different problems. This was one of the mo main motivation for a bunch of uh, nuclear utilities in the early 80s to initiate a program called SQUAD, the Seismic Qualification Utility Group, to try to respond to some of the NRC concerns about qualification and ruggedness of nuclear installation. As you can imagine, the focus originally from this group was on nuclear installation, but uh, now many earthquakes luckily happen on nuclear power plants, so they quickly realized that there are many critical facilities, many critical lifeline facilities out there that have um, very similar equipment to what you will find in nuclear power plants. So I'm not talking about the reactor vessel, but think about, for example, banks, um, pumps, MCCs, uh, you name it. All these kind of mechanical and electrical equipment that you find, for example, in hospital, treatment plants, ports, substation, dams, they're actually very similar to what you will find in nuclear power plants. So the, what we call the squad database, it's really an example of the performance of equipment in worldwide earthquake of critical lifelines. The database includes 35 earthquakes worldwide spanning five decades, 30 equipment classes, and almost 4,000 data sets. So it's a very large database and has been used for a variety of reasons. Uh, firstly, to establish typical vulnerabilities that you will want to avoid in uh, nuclear installation. So just understanding what can go wrong and making sure that doesn't happen in a nuclear power plant. Uh, it was used to establish high confidence capacities. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about what I mean for squawk spectrum. And I have been involved with EPRI uh, specifically to try to take this experience and expand it uh, with new as we collect new information. So on the right, I'm showing um, typical equipment capacity. For the sake of this presentation, what I mean for capacity is really 
this S curve or fragility, we call it sometimes. It's a function that is expressing the probability of failure given a ground motion. It can be peak ground acceleration, it can be other spectral acceleration, but essentially it's telling you what's the probability of your equipment failing if you have some earthquake demand at your site. This S curve can be defined by either two points on the curve. Uh, we typically use the median point, C sub n, or the high confidence, low probability of failure, which is roughly represented by the 1% non exceedance probability point. Or you can define this shape by having one point on the curve and the slope of the curve, which is the what we call um, composite variability. So this is a characterization of the uncertainty and randomness that you have in your capacity and demand. So I'm going to use these terms throughout this presentation. Before I dive into the equation, let me explain, you know, one of the, the questions that I get is, well, this database is so large and so, you know, detailed, why do we need to expand it? And there are a couple of reasons why we want to do that and, you know, why I went to Turkey. First of all, we want to expand the database to collect uh, and capture new designs. So think about, for example, these uh, horizontally mounted batteries. We are used to seeing vertically mounted batteries in uh, in industrial plants. So what does it do to my understanding? You know, if the lead plates are horizontal, is the capacity of this battery lower or higher? So we want to capture that. We also want to capture um, how new vintage design is behaving during, during earthquakes. So think about, for example, the same design all over, over decades, but uh, think, for example, the case where a manufacturer is removing margin, is decreasing the thickness of the control panel, or is using less anchorage because now our understanding of the seismic behavior has improved. And so manufacturer decide to remove margin that is not necessary. So what does it do to our prior knowledge, our prior understanding of the seismic behavior of equipment? We want to capture new failure modes if, if we ever find new, and we also want to document success data. And I want to stress the importance of that because historically, post circuit investigation that focus on what went wrong, and in the last decade, it's becoming apparent that if you want to do statistics and you only have fail, you only have failure data, then it's a little bit difficult. So it's equally important to document what went well, so it's easier to demonstrate uh, what is the, the the capacity of your equipment. Turkey was in many ways a good opportunity to learn from experience. First of all, um, many people have talked about the extent of the area is roughly the uh, the state of Kentucky. It's a very economically de developed area. So we knew going in that there was a possibility of reviewing a large inventory of equipment, spending many decades of vintage and different designs. So uh, it's important to include diversity in the database. And other people have talked about uh, the high ground motion that we're recording in the area. And I'm going to come back to why that's important. All right. so. In practice, what do we do with this observation? So say you went to a site and uh, you reviewed this control panel, which was installed near the ground and it was subject to this ground motion as survived. And then you review a similar panel up in the structure fourth floor, which was subject to an amplified motion and failed. One way to picture this is shown on the right figure where on the y-axis is the probability of failure. The red dots represents all these cabinets that fail, and in green, all these cabinets that have survived. So they are assigned at zero probability of failure. So what we are trying to do from a higher level perspective is to use these dots and develop some function that describes the likelihood, the probability of this equipment to fail given a ground motion. Now, one thing uh, the SPOG program did at the beginning was let's try to simplify the problem 
and let's try to, to find you know shortcuts to demonstrate increased capacity. So before going into the detail of defining this S curve, let's identify um, common vulnerabilities that lead to failure. And in fact, what they did, they developed a, a list of caveats or criteria that you want to meet in nuclear equipment to demonstrate increased capacity. So for example, if we're talking about control panel, they observed that, well, if the cabinet is not anchored, then it's more likely to fail. So is it a problem with the cabinet or is you know the fact that the, the cabinet was not anchored? If the cabinet was anchored, probably you could have justified an increased capacity. If the cards at the back of the cabinet are not screwed in, then they are more likely to fail. So again, let's develop a list of typical vulnerabilities. And if we can exclude that in um, nuclear installation, that we can demonstrate an increase an increased capacity. So this was the first attempt to develop a, a kind of a high confidence level capacity. So they took four of the largest earthquake they review in the early 80s and 70s in California. And they review many sites subject to these earthquakes. And they concluded that if the equipment didn't have those vulnerabilities, they were capable of withstanding this ground motion with high confidence. So this was the origin of what we call today the squad reference spectrum, which is this in green. It's described by a 1.2 G broad banded demand. The broad banded demand is defined between two and a half and seven and a half Hertz, which they indicated or they suggested as a better predictor of equipment performance instead of PGA. And that's because most of the equipment responds in, in that frequency range. They also uh, recognize that when, you're, when you want to use this for qualification or seismic margin assessment or seismic or realistic risk assessment, you want to compare the seismic capacity to the seismic demand expressed at the equipment mounting point. And long story short, I don't have the time to discuss this here, but they expanded this ground motion capacity to any structure equivalent motion by applying a 1.5 amplification factor. So this is kind of the background of how we came up with this high confidence level. And then uh, subsequent research project built on that. And um, there was a project that developed this generalized in-structure equipment capacity. Uh, a bunch of experts were put together and they're based on their judgment and opinion and a bunch of uh, shake table tests, they judge that uh, the median capacity would have been at least two and a half times higher the high confidence level. And so that's how they established this generic in structure equipment capacity, 4.8 G median and 1.8 G 1% um, probability of failure which translate to a failure um, to a um, composite vulnerability of 0.42. This is the story of this generic capacity that has been used in many risk assessment for many different uh, application and industrial sites. I was personally tasked, you know, personally engaged with EPRI to try to take this a little bit further. So how can we improve this uh, framework how can we incorporate new experience as we expand the database? Can we make this capacity class specific? And can we incorporate failures if we need to? So those are some of the most important questions I try to solve. And uh, I can point you to a bunch of research reports that we publish where we explore different ideas. And for the sake of you know the, the time limit I have today, I'm gonna focus on uh, Bayesian inference, which I think is the most promising one. So I don't have the time to cover everything, but in simple terms, Bayesian inference theorem tells you that um, if you have a if you want to compute your um, updated posterior understanding of what the capacity should be, you can just use this simple equation where you take your prior understanding of what the capacity could be and use a likelihood function to incorporate your observation 
into your understanding. Sounds a lot complicated, but to give you a simple example of a simple cartoon of to explain this concept, if you have a prior distribution of what you think the capacity of the equipment should be, which I showed you in the previous slide, you go in the field and you find that a cabinet survived a strong motion, which is to the right of your prior distribution. This evidence is telling you that your prior understanding of what a capacity should be or could be is conservative. This evidence is telling you that the true capacity is probably to the right, it's probably higher than that. Conversely, if you have a failure that is to the left to your prior understanding, your evidence is telling you that uh, probably you were unconservative. So you should update your understanding to, uh, to be a little bit to the left, to be more conservative. This is, a, in a nutshell, the, the, what we're trying to do, except that we have many more dots and we, are, we don't really know if we're going to the left or right. On top of that, um, when you try to expand this idea of the Bayesian theorem to earthquake experience, there are some um, complications that we discussed in our reports. And I'm just gonna show you uh, or talk about two refinements that we propose to uh, merge this theorem with experience data. The first one is uh, expanding the likelihood function to include what I call ambiguous data. So here on the bottom left, I'm showing the typical binomial distribution to account for fit or success type of statistics. These term in yellow represent uh, this ambiguous data, which means essentially if you go to the field and you uh, document the performance of an equipment and you're not really sure whether it was a success or a failure, then this updated function is giving you the opportunity to model it with uh, some confidence of representing a failure. So for the sake of simplicity here, I'm showing 50%, but it can be anywhere between zero and 100. And this is very powerful for those that are familiar with statistics. It's, it's a powerful, powerful way to incorporate this ambiguous term. We also model the problem um, in 3D. So instead of looking at a 2D distribution, we included uncertainty on the variability of this uh, capacity and variability in the median, which essentially translate in a 3D, three-dimensional belt where the median point of this belt is your 2D representation. And so you're asking yourself, what is the pair of median capacity and variability in my domain that is more, most likely to reflect um, my observation? So in simple term, very simple term, you have your prior distribution, you have a likelihood function that represents your observation, you multiply your green belt and your red curve, and you get a posterior distribution, which is this bell curve. The median point of that bell curve will represent your updated understanding of the best estimate of the what the capacity could be. Sounds complicated, but it's not. And let me show you how this is done in practice. So I told you we visited more than 160 sites. And here on the left, those are the 38 uh, sites associated with the highest ground motions. And let's say that 18 of these sites have engine generators that survive following the earthquake. You can compute the broadband demand associated with that PGA. And if I plot that on top of my prior, it will look something like this. So this data are providing some evidence that what I thought the prior, the, the capacity, the generic capacity was, it's probably higher than that. So if I do my Bayesian statistics, I get this black uh, blue curve, Again, is this is the, the, the median point of the um, bell procedure. So essentially, in few words, the Bayesian framework is a way to account for your prior understanding of the problem, sub subjective understanding of the problem, and incorporate observation, merge the two, to, un to give you a better understanding of what the, what the capacity could be. And um, just to emphasize this point, 
I developed two sensitivity studies to 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 show you why the Bayesian inference method is is uh, a very robust method. So, say on top of the Turkish data, you review the squad database and you identify twenty and eight more data that can be added to your statistics, except that the Turkish data are associated with high ground motion and the existing squad data are uh, in the lower ground motion region. So if you try to repeat your statistics, what you will get is this black updated curve. And you can see that the improvement, the margin, the additional margin that you get is very small. This is one way to see this, the importance of this Bayesian statistic in the sense that um, these black dots that you're adding may be more than 30, but they are associated with a ground motion uh, level that is slower than the Turkish data. And so what your Bayesian update is telling you, well, you are not really informing what I already knew. You can add as many data as you want, if they're associated with low ground motion, they are not going to improve your understanding. To really improve your understanding, you need to test your capacity to increase level. And this goes back to the idea that I talked earlier. Earthquake ground motion are very uh, useful to provide you some knowledge. And the Turkish data are very useful because they are associated with strong ground motion. But if you want to develop, um, you know, improve your uh, understanding of the capacity, you need to test your equipment to increase ground motion level. One way to do it is using shape table tests. And as I mentioned earlier, this has some advantages and disadvantages. It's very expensive for some uh, equipment classes or other maybe more feasible. And this is just an example to show you that if you can really test your equipment to true fair or, or say middle fair, then your fragility starts to be improved, getting to close, you know, closer to the true fragility, and the variability starts to decrease, meaning the fragility becomes more vertical, uh, which essentially means that you're becoming more confident that you're reaching your true uh, capacity. Uh, there are some nuances when you try to incorporate shake table test data with earth experience data, and uh, I, I'll point you to this report. Uh, and if you don't have access to this every report, there are some conference paper that we published summarizing the, 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 the framework and the takeaway. So um, please reach out to me if you want to see the nuts and bolts and if you want to have a discussion. I know some research group have already taken this framework and used it in practice for specific problem. And I, I'm just going to conclude emphasizing that this is a very general framework. We have used it for seismic loading on equipment, but it can be generalized to any loading. It can be wind, can be flood, and it can also be applied to many different problems. We have used it for dams. It can be used for buildings, pipings, and etc. So if you want to learn more, le learn more, please reach out to me. And uh, <laughs> thank you for being with me throughout this uh, technical presentation. And uh, I hope uh, you enjoyed And I'm going to open the floor for questions. And, let me know, I mean, Reza, if you want to keep the question for now or later. Thank you, Ricardo, for your great presentation. We're going to go to the next uh, presenter, and then we go back for the question and answers. Okay. Um, yes. Our next uh, presenter is Rupa, Rupa Farai. Uh, she has a master in uh, structural engineering from Stanford University. She is licensed professional engineer and licensed structural engineer. Uh, and she is a senior associate principal in SOM with more than 20 years of experience in structural engineering services. She has led the design of new construction and retrofitted structures, including mixed use, commercial, airport, courthouse, um, education, residential, and everything. So um, Rupa, it's a pleasure having you. Please go ahead and share your slides. Can you all hear me okay? Yes. Okay. And I'm sharing the right screen of thought, I hope so. Yes, yes. Okay. Um, thank you. Thank you for the floor in here. Um, really glad to be a part of this webinar and share with you what we have collectively learned in Tokyo earthquake. Um, 
we were we had a group of engineers we were there as a part of the eri and for and we had the three teams as you all know but even in part in being a part of the three uh, teams this particular team the six people that you see on the screen were part of the buildings team and we we were closely located you know uh, closely communicating with the hospitals team as well as uh, with the other team that we had but clearly our focus was very different from the hospitals team and the infrastructure team that we had in there so as a quick uh, outline for this presentation today we'll just walk you through the breadth and the depth of our observations. Uh, we have performance levels uh, for the buildings that we had seen. We would want to describe that to you at a system level. And then since most of the buildings were reinforced concrete, we would want to get into the components specific to reinforced concrete structures. And then finally end this uh, presentation with the non-structural components, which was a major criteria, although uh, we would touch on it based on the building performance versus um you know um versus ali who actually touched on the hospitals uh, which was more unique to that uh, type of building so clearly um we had two major earthquakes on february 6th and following that there were quite a few aftershocks and the fault rupture was about more than 400 kilometers long. Um, quite a few cities that were affected. 11 plus 2 that uh, was provided. It clearly shows the 11 provinces in the southern uh, Turkey that is colored in here. And most of the damage was actually seen in the Hatay, Marash area, Adyaman, Malatay, Gaziantep, Osmania, compared to the West. Um, in here, we are showing you um, each, we are showing you the uh, PGA for each of the earthquakes. This was the first one, which had a magnitude of 7.8, uh, 7 um, and in the Richter scale. And clearly it has this shake maps, which had, which had higher intensity right in the Gaziantep and the Antakya region. The outer blue region, it corresponds to 0 0.02 G PGA contour in this area. Um, the next one which happened uh, is an, this is an overlay of the 7.5 magnitude earthquake. That was a second earthquake that happened. And you can see uh, this increased the area, but there were regions that were um, together along with the previous earthquake that had happened. So one, uh, most of the area, some of the areas have actually seen both the earthquakes pretty significant magnitude shake, shaking. And then the next one, which we have in here is the aftershock, which is an overlay of that one as well. And you have this USGS shake map showing the PGA contours for the 6.7 magnitude aftershock um, that happened after the first two events. And then Finally, um, just to give you a sense of the ground motions that were recorded in the different stations that were in the network, there, the, the 7.8 magnitude earthquake was recorded at 285 uh, stations. The 7.5 was recorded in about 320 stations and the 6.3 uh, was all sorry, the 6.3 was recorded in 320, uh, 148 stations as well. And clearly the destruction was massive, as we know in the Antakya region. And there is a clear delineation of the city, what the city was before and after the earthquake. Um, quite a lot of buildings were completely wiped off. But when we look into those 11 provinces that we are talking about, what's important to note in the 11 provinces, 89% of the building were residential. Not to look into all the numbers in here, but just focus on this one, 89% uh, were residential. 
And of the residential buildings, we wanted to look at how many of them were post to the 2001 uh, built. And actually, for, we found that 47% of the buildings were built after 2001. And quite a few of them were actually built in accordance to 2007 building code, which is comparable to AAC 705. And in the Marash and Hatai regions, we saw most of the damaged buildings with various damage levels, uh, anywhere from the minor damage to collapse. The Hatai region um, saw most number of heavy damaged or collapsed building, 42% of them were totally collapsed. Uh, relating to the previous slide and the last slide on this slide, you can see that the Hatai region saw the maximum percentage of heavy damage to collapse with the year of uh, construction. And so the uh, so it became important for our team to focus on certain aspects of our observations, and we took we took uh, we basically segmented our studies. It was not to look into the buildings that were intensely damaged, but we wanted to look at the wide range of the buildings with the types and occupancies. And we were focusing our observation mostly on the newer construction buildings, which we thought were good design and good construction. And if we could get some data from those to understand uh, what could be improved in the code. So again, our focus was mostly on strong levels of shaking and how it affected the new constructed buildings. Then we also took a step at correlating the structural damage to the ground motion intensity directly, because that is an important uh, information that the designers need. And then finally, we looked at the structural and the non-structural damage that had occurred in these buildings. So again, if you look in this uh, thing there, this team actually traveled a long distance in here. We actually visited most of the cities. Uh, they are highlighted in this focus in this area. And these regions had earthquake intensities greater than 0.2 G, clearly. We looked at, we went to 126 sites, um, some with little damage, some with extensive damage. And we, I'll tell you, like, we visited about 12 cities. And the extent of the damage and the damage level that we saw uh, was very different. For example, like Golbasi was a place which is over here on the um, on the middle uh, left. That was an area that was affected by liquefaction. Malatya did not see a 0.2 G earthquake, but it saw, uh, and it had newer construction, but there were significant damages which Ha which resulted in a complete empty city. Clearly, Antama, uh, Antakya was completely, not completely, but mostly wiped out. And so every city has a peculiarity to it, and we extend, and we will just show you or we'll walk you through uh, the damage levels that we have seen in them. We prepared a complete statistics of oh, what the buildings were, what the building type were, when they were built, or what was the location, what kind of uh, magnitude uh, PGA or PGB that we have seen at those cases for different earthquakes. We collected that data. And then we tried to prepare some statistics for you so that we can make sense out of it. So clearly, as we mentioned, out of the 126 sites that we visited, um, and there were about 160 buildings, 91% of them were residential. And on the right, you can see on this pie chart that 85% of the residential building was reinforced concrete frame and shear wall building. We looked at also the, for, for the buildings that we visited, most of them were from six to 10 to story tall. Um, there were a few taller buildings for 11, 12 stories, and they were about 22 of them. So you can see that this was the demographics of the height of the building that we have seen in here. And then when we started looking into the damage class 
obviously we were more focused on heavily damaged or moderately damaged uh, uh, buildings and clearly the ones that we visited 58 per 8 percent of them were heavily damaged and then if we take the damage uh, descriptions you know it was anywhere between a diagonal cracking uh, rebar buckling rebar rupture concrete crushing diaphragm cracking or plastic hinging but most of the results that we saw in this reinforced concrete frame and shear wall building was due to the rebar buckling and uh, co concrete crushing and plastic hinges, hinging at the moment frame joints and honestly speaking um, clearly we the, when we talk about the plastic hinges, it could occur either at the beam or it could occur at the column. But then there were instances where it clearly occurred between the beam as well as the column. And we all know that we want the beam, we want the hinging, plastic hinging to primarily occur on the beams. But that wasn't the case that we saw. Many of them occurred in the column. As a result of that, there were partial collapse to a total collapse of those buildings. Um, when it got to the rebar buckling also quite a few of them i mean there were quite a few of them occurred in the walls as well in addition to the beams and the columns and in some cases we saw combination of all the three occurring um and they 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 were they were not less either they were not uh, they were significant enough the diagonal cracking was another instance, and again, uh, we did shear. We did see the shear occurring not only the beams but the columns and the wall, and then we saw the combination as well that occurred. But let's talk a little bit about the system behavior, and this was this was a site where four buildings. Uh, were being built. These are residential buildings that uh, were reinforced concrete, shear wall, and frame structure. And clearly, in this, and you can see that on the on the top uh, left is the building plan, and we can clearly see that somehow most of the shear wall piers were designed such that they were in the transverse direction and. So the lateral system in the longitudinal direction was almost deficient. There were less number of walls. Um, it was not adequately designed. And as a result of that, we saw significant uh, collapses and damages in this one. One of the building was uh, complete, had complete collapsed because of the tension um, and uh, the column failing at the bottom level. The On the other one, uh, we saw a huge amount of P delta effects. And then the there the other, the third one, we could see that significant hinging in the shear wall, in the beams, as well as a combination of those systems. But finally, the fourth one, which actually had survived, was not completely built, was only up to five or six levels. And it had seen damages, but again, the construction had completely stopped. But all these failures were actually brittle. And that brings us to the next thing that we saw that there were, uh, th this one in particular, uh, it's, it's, a build, it's a complex with 16 buildings, I believe. And in this case, two of the buildings had completely collapsed. And the remaining, which were there, had seen significant damage such that they were, they would be, uh, they would be completely demolished. There was no way of repairing it. And these failures were actually brittle. It wasn't ductile as we would design for in by today's code. And another interesting fact about the system was this particular complex, which had identical, and this was located in Malata, which did which had seen a PGA of less than 0.2G. But in this particular instance, um, there are two exactly uh, same buildings designed by the same engineer, designed to the same code, designed by the same contractor. But one of the building had partially collapsed and the other building was standing right. When you look closely into it, what had happened is on the left, this particular, on the left building that had seen uh, the 
uh, the the failure in the ground floor columns did not have infill walls on the right the building which is which had the infill walls somehow added the added stiffness to the building allowing or preventing the building from the collapse and allowing evacuation of the occupants of that particular building this is not to say that um, using using the infill walls as a lateral system is important but this is just to show you how the infill walls can indeed change the behavior of or per, the performance of a particular building and then uh, this one is a famous uh, uh, collapse story where this buildings, these buildings in Rosanans, uh, in the apartment complex in Antakya had completely collapsed. There were about 750 people who died in this one. There was a tension failure uh, totally, which, uh, you know, is, is not to be expected in a, in a properly designed building code. And if you see, these columns had actually failed in tension and Ha and it was a brittle failure as compared to the one that we have seen um, the failure in the parking structure in the Northridge earthquake in California, which had a pretty ductile behavior. And that is, if you design the building to a proper code, you would expect to see that behavior rather than a brittle collapse. Nevertheless, this was an important um, thing uh, in the news, and uh, one of our one of our team members was heavily involved in uh, really um, understanding this particular behavior in here. Also, there were other buildings that we had seen, which from the outside looked uh, pretty good. Did not we feel that it did not damage, but when we went inside, we were able to see heavy damage in the shear walls, less, and that is because of the detailing that how it was done in these cases. Um, we also looked at, rather than just uh, taking a step back, a step away from um, the concrete buildings only, we looked at the steel buildings um, as well. And in this case, the steel framed area, which uh, steel framed buildings that you see in here in this picture, these were the three um, buildings that had seen a similar level of ground motion and it remained intact and perhaps most undamaged in the suite of buildings that we have seen. Um, the irony is that uh, these three buildings were mostly were 90% empty because of how expensive this building was. Um, and the contractor as well as the engineer was out of business because they were not able to sell these buildings. But clearly, this was a building that had seen minimal damage in an earthquake uh, where so many other residential buildings have seen brittle failure. Not to say that uh, all steel buildings um, remained, remained uh, uh, showed great performance. This um, one in case was a very, uh, was a, also a steel framed residential building, which was fairly uh, unique to find. But in this case, actually, uh, there was this column where basically the column had uh, slipped off um, the basement wall and it was an anchor failure that had resulted in a complete collapse, or I wouldn't say complete, but a partial collapse of this building where this building had to be now taken down in its entirety. In addition, uh, we saw some issues with vertical irregularity as well. It was it was a common practice in the buildings that we visited where it is in, in the ground floor, the buildings were had a smaller footprint than the upper floor levels. And there were many conditions where there was a transfer of the shear walls that was occurring. And because it was not designed correctly to take this offset force levels, you, we saw extensive damage in the beams and the cantilever beams in here. Um, more conditions of these increased damage behavior. And also 
you know, there were regions where we saw buildings were located just next to each other with the diaphragms of the two different buildings not aligned. As a result of that, clearly there was huge amount of pounding effects to some regions where there was uh, quite a bit of collapse or partial collapse that was noted in these buildings. As uh, mentioned for the Golbasi area, we saw huge amount of uh, liquefaction that resulted in settlement and overturning. And then just to get into system, uh, just to get from the system level into the component levels, there were many buildings where we saw that the floor slabs were uh, designed for the Asmolan system, which is a common practice that is used in Turkey. And in this case, because of how the die how the diaphragm and the joists are placed, it forms as this thick slab uh, framing structure. And the what it results in doing is having this wide beams that are framing into the column, uh, a slender column. As a result of that, the framing is much more robust than the column. The slab system, is clearly not is is very strong and rigid and because of that there is we we cannot have the strong column weak beam behavior that is desired uh, out of the the structural system clearly the collapse was known or the um, deformation extensive deformation was noted in the columns which had resulted in quite a significant amount of partial collapses in these buildings. Here is a condition where you we actually saw a rare floor slab, of, you know, the floor slab failure, which was pretty rare, but most of the cases we saw that the slab remained intact, but the vertical elements like the columns and walls have had seen significant damage. And then in case in looking at the beams, uh, you know, we could clearly see that some good behavior where the initiation of the hinges were occurring in the beams and the columns and slabs were uh, columns and the walls were um, actually re remaining intact. So the, those were one of the good behaviors that we saw, but then there were significant amount of damages that we had seen in the beams and the hinging beams as well. And these are going to be hard to um, mitigate or hard to rectify. These buildings which had these significant damages will also have to be brought down. In some cases, we did see um, the coupling behavior, uh, coupling deep beam behavior um, as expected, as designed for. And then there were instances where due to insufficient transverse steel and uh, we saw extensive hinging at the bottom of the column or at right at the location where the slab framing or the beam framing met the column. The damage in the column was so huge that these buildings will have to be brought down. Clearly, uh, even in the damaged buildings, in some locations, we did see good behavior. You can see the closely spaced ties that we detail in these uh, columns. Uh, it was it was located, but there were some hinges that uh, occurred and the high seismicity also, uh, which led to the collapse. But there were instances, there were some instances where we observed good detailing as well. But on the others, you can clearly see a very clear shear failure in the columns as well as in the uh, in in the in, in the column elements another important thing that we not noticed is in most of the buildings um, 10 to 12 stories tall what what happened is the corner columns were severely impacted and that is because there were two different seismic motion perhaps, which does a, which had this increased demands by actually. And as a result of those, somehow the columns were not, the corner columns were not designed to the, to the, uh, the capacity of the column was not sufficient, which resulted in this kind of failure um, leading to 
you know, collapses and the soft story um, collapses. Again, uh, some failures in the weaker direction of the beams uh, or weaker di direction of the columns as well. And then we saw some short column effects where we where we had these uh, columns interacting along with the uh, yeah, along with the uh, walls, shear walls, uh, which had concrete crushing issues. And then uh, he, we saw, and this this location was pretty clear where we had component where we had foundation comp components which had completely settled under the liquefaction. Nevertheless, uh, we did see many other buildings, and as we just spoke about, um, you know, most of our attention was focused on the residential buildings along with the reinforced concrete and shear wall frame system, but. In addition to those were some historical buildings, uh, some that remained in a real good condition, even though they were 70, 80 years old, and the others, uh, clearly the unreinforced masonry buildings, which were completely damaged. And then I, I'm not gonna talk about these buildings because Ali spoke about it. Um, also, in regards to the school and the government buildings, some had retrofitted, the upper two were retrofitted and did not see any significant damage. But then there were other cases um, on the left side, you see this is a courthouse building on the uh, lower left is a courthouse building, which had seen significant damage in, in the shear walls. On the right, it's a fairly new building. It's a part of the university. Uh, it, er, we would say that it was really designed well, but what was not adequately taken care of was the um, was the amount of movement that could have occurred in a maximum credible earthquake, and this led to the bridge support um, sliding off the support system and causing this failure. In addition, there were non-structural dam damages to the facades uh, that we had observed, the interior partitions, which had seen significant damages, and this, this is inside of the residential building, and including the shops uh, and schools that we had, where we had seen the ceilings and intensive ceiling damages as well. But what is more important is this, um, to see is this non-structural stair damage. And what we had seen is that because of this, um, and this occurred in many different cases where the stairs were participating as a lateral, as perhaps the lateral system and were in effectively a part of the load path and they couldn't take it. And because of that, they had seen the significant amount of damage. As a result, people were not able to evacuate the building at the right time. And this poses a huge question about the functional recovery. Clearly, 232,000 um, buildings had collapsed, which these this was about 30% of the building stock. And these buildings could not attain the collapse prevention criteria during an MCE level earthquake. Significant disruption had occurred to the continued operation. And so this poses a huge question like, do we envision the codes and the standards to achieve just life safety in um, a design level earthquake? And should we not be designing for recovery times, thus targeting the functional recovery as a, a, as a way to um, follow the codes? So clearly, um, summarizing the lessons uh, that we have learned from this particular earthquake, uh, clearly there is a possibility of having an earthquake which is greater than MCE. Sometimes we talk with our friends that that earthquake is not gonna happen, but it may really happen and we should be um, focused on detailing it correctly. Uh, that is really important to safeguard the building from collapse prevention. Um, there were many buildings which were post-2000 buildings, and if it was built to code, it would have performed as expected. But then there were heavy damage buildings that we saw in even in the post-2000 buildings. And that was due to the uh, code compliance issues. There were inadequate detailing and there were severe design problems which we actually saw and should be looked into more carefully. 
Now, because of a certain system, we always did not uh, see the strong column weak theme behavior in the moment frame system. Uh, it is important to take a consideration of these ones in locations where we have wider beams and this particular approach should be actually dealt with and uh, we should do a further research on this aspect of it. And finally, um, it is important to provide sliding joints for the stair so that it remains intact irrespective of whether it's a steel building or a concrete building, because these are the means of egress. And if they are not serviceable during an earthquake, it's really difficult to evacuate it and may result in loss of life. Infill wall construction, which is a common practice, uh, we got to have uh, codes, uh, we got to consider them uh, clearly as to how they are detailed when they meet the walls, the frame walls along them. And it is important uh, for us as an engineering community um, to present the different scenarios uh, to the stakeholders that, and to understand that codes are indeed the minimum criteria and should we not be uh, looking forward to designing something that is more than code minimum criteria. And that's where I would end uh, this presentation today. If you have any questions, um, feel free. All right. Thank you so much. You're welcome, Hamid. It was a great presentation. We have a few questions. Um, it's from everybody, but please feel free to jump in and answer them. One of them is uh, Matthew is asking for the floor staff failures where column and beams survive. Are there any theories uh, as to why this behavior occurred? Anyone can jump in. Is the question why the columns and the beams survived? Yeah, it's asking on the slab failure where column and beams survived. Then yeah. Matthew is asking why it happens. Well, clearly, uh, if you're looking at it, it's important to understand the size, you know, what kind of ground motion or what kind of intensity was felt by the building in which particular direction, right? And if they're if they survived, um it, it's I, I mean, is it a I'm trying to understand the question. If it survived because why the columns survived versus the beams, I, I'm still not I'm still not very clear on that one. Well, the exact question is Matthew asking. Um, I'm, I'm, it's a little bit vague to me uh, also, but he's asking for the floor slab failures where columns and beams survived. Uh, is, what's the reason for that? He's asking literally why floor slab fails while beam and column are okay. Well, usually that did not happen. It did not happen that the floor slabs survived. The floor. I think we have a clarification. So when the floor slabs fail, why the rest of the structure does not? So I think you showed us picture where there was a slab that failed uh, clearly out of plane, but the structure was still uh, uh, standing. That's my interpretation. No, I, I, okay, got it. I think one second, if I can go back to that slide, yeah. Okay, are we talking about, uh, uh, maybe I'm not sharing here. You are not sharing. If I can quickly share. Are we talking about this particular system in here? And if this is a case, you know, the slab collapsed, but also the columns and the beams that surrounding mm -hmm. it had collapsed as well. 
Yeah, yeah, that one is so it, Yeah, it was only on one side of the structure. And if 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 it survived, it survived on the other side. So clearly there was a diaphragm issue in this particular, in the design of this particular flow slab, if that makes sense. Yes, correct. Uh, we have one more question also. Um, Scott was asking, um, I don't know if it's for uh, Ricardo, you or um, Ali or Reid, uh, asking how does California Office of Emergency Services um, is comparing the California Office of Emergency Services post, post earthquake building tagging with the Turkish? Doesn't sound a question for me. Go ahead. Oh, if you want. It's probably either for Ray or Ali or, or Ruba. Um, I, I can touch on that one. So in Cali OS, it is um, green tag, yellow tag, red tag. Um, for the one that I heard in, in Turkey, it's a different scale, uh, uh, no damage, um, light damage, medium damage, heavy damage, and um, and buildings tend to be demoed. So um, uh, the the heavy damage and um, and that buildings to be demoed, basically those are kind of destined to be demoed. The the medium is um, it has a meaning. Uh, you have about um, one year to retrofit, or if you can't, then the government uh, basically uh, may uh, dictate uh, demo. I don't know what the uh, status of that uh, definition at this point, but the, the scale and, and the meanings are different. Right. Um, we, I don't see any other question. Gloria, do you see any question? All right, so. Wait, yes, there is another comment. So uh, corruption in construction and poor execution are the same thing. So why did some buildings collapse and others not? The effect of the soil should be mentioned here. Most codes in the Middle East, especially in Arab countries, are direct copies of American or international codes. Is this a good idea? Shouldn't there be some sort of, of adaptation to the region? I can reread it if you want. I, I mean, it mainly focuses on uh, uh, corruption in construction and poor execution, that uh, they mainly mean the same. Um, there is one question, why did some buildings collapse and others did not? Um, some considerations regarding the effect of the soil. And then one consideration regarding uh, uh, slightly translating the American or international codes into uh, Middle East countries. Is this a good or bad idea? I can share some thoughts on that. Um, I think the, perform the poor performance that was observed in Turkey, I don't think we have the clear picture yet of exactly which aspect contributed the most in each case. So, you know, the if you're far from the fault, the reason for a building collapsing are probably different if you're closer to the fault. And if a, if an area was subject to three strong ground motion, uh, you know, it's probably different. The progressive damage that we talked about may have played a, a high role. So some people have brought up this corruption issue and poor execution. Uh, they may they play a role, important role, but it really depends where you are. So I would not generalize this concept to everywhere. In fact, uh, you know, if you have a, a, an earthquake that is performs, you know, provides life safety after a seven point eight and collapses after a seven point seven, I would argue that it's that's a good performance, not a bad performance. So it's it, it takes a little bit more digging to really extrapolate everything. Um, code wise, uh, I think you know I don't see a reason why not uh, leveraging. Uh, updated codes in US uh, as long as the material perform to the same level. So 
and there is a question about materials and construction that needs to be answered. Um, but um, I, I see why not? That's a possibility. In terms of local effects, I've seen some other presentations talking about um, how local effects or activity have played a role in this earthquake. I think it's something that needs to be investigated. I can give you my, my direct impression as I was driving through the uh, strong motion region. There were kilometers with no damage at all, and then a few kilometers with complete damage. So I think there was a strong correlation with the local amplifications. And um, you know, I'm th I think in the future we'll see more presentation about it. I think it's a little bit too early to, to really understand uh, with what was driving exactly the damage in which area. Mm -hmm. Okay, right. any other? Yeah, any we, other? Have a, we have a couple more. Yeah, if anybody else wants to jump in in this question, any comments about codes or? If you're okay, we can proceed with the others. Yeah. Um. Somebody's asking, did, did you have any chance to talk to the Turkish engineers regarding performance of those buildings? Yes, we did uh, interact with quite a few engineers, professional engineers, as well as professors from the university. Um, clearly, from the level of knowledge that they have in terms of seismic engineering, they were, they knew what, uh, what what the code requirements were and most in in some cases they pointed out to locations where um you know the, the buildings were designed to the code and there but what gets implemented was the site in the site was a little different from what was documented in the code uh, co in 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 the uh, in or what was submitted for permit versus what was actually built. Um, so there were some instances where we have seen clear discrepancies on those ones as well. But in terms of knowledge, we found that they had adequate knowledge about structural behavior. Perfect, great. Any other questions? Gloria, you have anything to add? No, nothing here in the Q&A section. Oh, maybe another one. Yes, would you recommend designing staircases to be part of lateral load resisting elements? Uh, I in all professional thing, we wouldn't um, recommend designing the stair to be designed as a lateral force resisting element. Um, having them as sliders, you know, th that is one thing that needs to be uh, designed elastically and it should have the proper capacity for sliding motion so that people can evacuate even after a major earthquake. Once the stair goes, people yeah, and the elevators are not running, imagine the condition of the people who are in 12-story building and they are not able to evacuate. Mm -hmm. And in most of the buildings that we saw, the stairs were one of the first ones to give. Yeah. Right. Perfect. Cool. With that, I'm going to hand it to uh, Elizabeth. Thank you so much, everybody, for uh, joining us. It was a, a great presentation. Thanks to our presenters. Great. Uh, thank you again to the San Diego Regional Chapter for organizing this series. Um, I'd like to ask you to please complete the post-webinar survey that should pop up in your browser or you'll receive it by email tomorrow after this webinar. We have another webinar in this series on Friday, October 27th. It's going to focus on impacts of social recovery. Um, Louise Comfort and Kit Miyamoto will be speaking about that, but we'll also have an additional presentation then that was going to be in this session um, on lifelines and functional recovery because the speaker had to reschedule. Uh, and if you're registered for uh, this session, you'll be automatically registered for that and receive a reminder. You can learn more about ERI at our website. Um, and to support the work that is done by the reconnaissance teams that you heard from in this session that go into the field and look at these impacts uh, and study them in order to increase our knowledge about earthquake resilience, 
uh, you can donate to the L the Learning from Earthquakes LFE endowment uh, at the link there. And then finally, I just want to acknowledge this webinar is supported with funding from FEMA uh, by ERI members like many of yourselves and by the LFE endowment fund. Thank you and look forward to seeing you for the next session on the 27th.